Okay, um, hello to everyone. Uh, very happy to see you all. Uh, today we have Edgar, who is going to, to tell us about the central dogma and entanglement in the Cedar space. So Edgar, take it away. Great, thanks Felipe. Uh, thanks for having me everybody. It's, uh, it's real nice to see some virtual faces at least. So I'm gonna dive right in. And in some sense, what I'm gonna be talking about are um, things that we would like to apply to the cosmological context from the black hole context. So given that, let me just quickly review some uh, basics of black holes. Here's a classical black hole. You've all seen it. This is a Schwarzschild black hole. Here's a quote. It's from a letter Schwarzschild wrote to Einstein at the end of 1915. He was a little optimistic. The war did not treat him very kindly. He was dead less than a year later. Uh, but here's the solution that he found. And um, it's pretty boring. You know, all the exciting stuff we see about black holes and study in the sky has to do with how a black hole interacts with its environment. But if you, you know, removed a classical black hole from its environment, it wouldn't do anything. It would just sit there. Okay. It's quite boring. A quantum black hole, on the other hand, as described by Hawking, is much more interesting. It doesn't just sit there, it evolves. It evolves by emitting Hawking radiation or Hawking quanta. These guys out here, some particle which are entangled with some uh, buddy partner on the inside. So these are in something like an entangled bell pair. And as it emits uh, these Hawking quanta, uh, the black hole shrinks and the mass decreases. And it just keeps doing this. It emits more and more until it continuously, we believe, uh, evaporates totally away, leaving just the entangled partners. Okay. One of the reasons why we're so fascinated uh, by this object is, of course, the black hole entropy formula. So similar to a gas in a box, black holes have a temperature and an entropy. Here I've written the entropy formula with all the fundamental constants put in. And the important thing is that it scales with the area of the event horizon. Okay, And it's fascinating because it seems to combine all these various subjects as fundamental constants from different branches of physics. That's partly why we're so obsessed with these things. You can ask, given the black hole entropy formula, you know, to state it somewhat poetically, uh, what are the atoms of a black hole? So Boltzmann provided some atomic description for a gas. Okay, there it is. He said that you could think of the entropy of a gas as all the different ways you can, you know, configure the microscopic constituents while keeping fixed some macroscopic parameters and provided some microscopic uh, interpretation of entropy. You can ask, is there a similar thing like that for black holes? And uh, what I'll call the black hole central dogma is an old idea in this idea that from the outside, you can think of a black hole this way. You could think of it as just an ordinary quantum system uh, with a Hilbert space uh, with dimensionality given by that formula we saw before. I set some of the constants to one, which I'll keep doing the rest of the talk. And it just evolves unitarily. It interacts with its environment and evolves unitarily. So as long as you don't jump in, it's just an ordinary quantum system. I, it's called a, a dogma because there's a lot of evidence for it from various points of view, but it's not, you know, it's not completely understood by any means. Something we've learned in the in the past few years in black hole physics is that the uh, region beyond the event horizon can be accessed from the outside. So normally you think if you drop something into the black hole, well, it's past the event horizon, it's the point of no return, I have to jump back in to get it again. Uh, but now we believe, well, we suspected for a long time, and now there's um, some even more evidence to, to support this point of view, that if you stay outside and just collect the Hawking radiation that comes from a black hole and manipulate it in just the right way, uh, you can access whatever you lost uh, inside the black hole. You don't actually have to jump inside. Okay, let's get on to the analogy with uh, cosmology. So here I'll just redraw for you a uh, black hole event horizon. So here's us, the observer. The event horizon is now this red dash circle. These arrows just represent the fact that space is collapsing, which means this, uh, let's say there's a photon trying to make it out to you, it's not gonna make it. Space is collapsing too quickly. Uh, it'll never exit this region and make it to our eyes. Cosmology, in particular an accelerating cosmology, uh, is somewhat the inverse situation. Instead of space collapsing in on itself, uh, it's somehow repelling, it's expanding. Given that, the event horizon now surrounds us. OK, 
okay? Such that if there's a photon sufficiently far away trying to make it to our eyes over here, it won't make it because space is gonna be expanding too rapidly in between us and the photon. So this is the sort of first key similarity between black holes and accelerating cosmologies. Not only do they share the notion of an event horizon, that event horizon also has a temperature and an entropy. Okay, the entropy is given by the same formula we saw before. And the temperature is due to a similar phenomenon. These uh, cosmic event horizons also radiate. So it's very natural to ask, do they obey a central dogma? By that, I mean, can you think um, of a cosmic horizon as just an ordinary quantum system with maybe e to the area over four G Newton states or some finite number of states set by uh, the entropy of the, of the horizon uh, in the way that we think of a black hole. Uh, this idea was first kind of um, suggested and pursued by, by these authors very soon after the discovery of a positive cosmological constant. But it's sort of, um, uh, it's a question that we would uh, love the answer to, and I'm going to partially explore it in today's talk. Okay, I've been speaking somewhat generally so far about accelerating cosmologies. I'm going to focus on, at least from the point of view of symmetries, the simplest accelerating cosmology, which is the Sitter space-time. It's not clear that it's the simplest from a top-down point of view, but at the level of uh, semi-classics and symmetries, it's the simplest. So here's the metric. Okay, this is written in the static patch coordinates which cover a piece of the full manifold. And they're nice coordinates because they sort of manifest the event horizon. So you see GTT goes to zero and R equals L. So there's an event horizon there. And here are the formulas for the temperature and the entropy. And we saw that entropy formula earlier. All right, before I go on, I should uh, paint the kind of cautionary tale, okay? so. Whenever I, I go through this slide, people in the audience often contribute their own cautionary tales. Um, if you're dying to do that, <laughs> please go ahead. But otherwise, let's just encapsulate that in these ellipses. Okay, there are lots of issues with this analogy between black holes and uh, accelerating cosmologies, but let me give you a few of my favorite ones. The first is, you know, when we talk about the black hole central dogma, I said there's a lot of evidence for it. You know, some of that key evidence is uh, microstate counting. The fact that starting from Storminger and Waffa and you know, a lot of uh, generalizations since and different perspectives since, we've had a microscopic understanding of the entropy of a black hole. It's coming from configurations of strings and brains or, or, or other such pictures. And there's basically little or no microscopic support for the gibbons Hawking entropy of cosmic horizons in the same way. There are intriguing computations and ideas, but I think it's fair to say that there's no kind of agreed upon uh, construction of the microstates of a cosmic horizon. Another thing that's different between the two is, you know, we think of a black hole horizon as encoding the interior, the horizon degrees of freedom, really in the old kind of uh, holographic perspective, uh, encode the interior of a black hole. They don't encode the exterior. So you, it's natural to ask for a cosmic horizon, which side does it encode? Does it encode the exterior, the interior, neither, both? So that's a question that one needs to address. And it's actually gonna play a central role in, in what I'm talking about in the second half of this talk. Okay, then we have the fact that the cosmic horizon, it's both more universal and more observer dependent than the black hole horizon. Okay, what do I mean by that? I say it's more universal because the horizon kind of comes for free uh, with the vacuum solution of like Einstein gravity with a positive cosmological constant. You don't need to excite the system in any way to have a cosmic horizon appear, it's just there. Whereas black holes in particular in anti-de Sitter space or even in flat space, we could think of them as excited states above the vacuum. So in that sense, they're not as universal. But um, cosmic horizons are more observer dependent. You know, everyone who stays outside of a black hole is gonna agree about where the event horizon is. Uh, that's not really true about the cosmic horizon. Different people in different parts of the universe are gonna have different cosmic horizons, okay? Finally, a technical point, which is related to holography and um, uh, other related things, is that there's no asymptotic region at fixed time with uh, weak gravity. Let's say we're talking about the sitter space, um, you know, the spatial slices are spheres. So you can't go to some asymptotic region at a fixed moment in time where gravity is weak, where you could ignore back reaction. In particular, there's no, you know, sort of time-like boundary that you might want to put a holographic dual theory on. So that's a, that's a technical point that makes things difficult. And I'll uh, 
bold this um, last thing is a. Uh, I wrote a paper of Adam Levine recently about this the, this this puzzle, which is that and this comment is going to be for the experts, of which there are many in the audience. Um, you can ask, uh, you know, with black holes, we learned that if you stay outside a black hole, you could encode what's beyond the horizon just by using the data that's outside the black hole. And it's natural to ask if the same thing is true in cosmology. Can you encode what's beyond the cosmic horizon just by encoding the stuff in the interior of your cavity, interior of your horizon? Now, if that were to be true, then two different observers in two different parts of the universe uh, would say the same thing. Uh, they would both encode the exterior of their horizon, but those regions can now overlap, okay? Uh, to use some jargon, the entanglement wedges would overlap. That does not happen in, in ADS-CFT or in black hole computations, and that poses a real problem because in certain more careful constructions, uh, which we explore in the paper, if those regions overlap, you can run into violations with no cloning and things like that. So it's, I think, a somewhat sharp puzzle that comes in exactly because of the observer dependence of the cosmic horizon, which is one of the key differences. Okay, that's that's my cautionary tale. I've warned you, so now I can uh, proceed and ignore the warning signs. So let's uh, proceed, and let me just give a little bit of background before saying how I'm going to try and explore. Uh, this problem. Uh, there are different ways to think about holography for de Sitter space. So here I've drawn the de Sitter Penrose diagram. Okay, it's a square. Each time slice is a sphere. So space is ending here and here. And the conformal boundaries are at the future and the past. Okay, this is global de Sitter space time. These dashed lines are the event horizons appropriate for an observer who lives at this point. And let's call uh, him or her the antipodal observer that lives over here. So they have this as the event horizon. And here I've drawn um, uh, what are called sometimes Bousseau wedges. You, you can ignore them, but they're just supposed to tell you the direction in which uh, uh, light sheets are contracting. Okay, so what have people done? Well, immediately after a positive CC was discovered, people tried to just do the analog thing, the analogy to ADS-CFT, which was called DSCFT, which was place the holographic dual theory at the conformal boundary of the space time which would be scry minus and scry plus. These are the conformal boundaries of the space time. Okay, this idea was kind of put forward by these people. And um, it took a while before some uh, the first kind of concrete model was proposed by these authors. And then we kind of generalized it to a family of models uh, in a later paper. But th these models are, are, are really ugly. The, the theory of gravity that's being described as some higher spin theory of gravity um, is very hard to compute anything in the, in the bulk picture. And um, there are some things that still are not understood to this day about um, higher topology surfaces. There uh, is a lot of uh, uh, confusion there, but you know some some progress was made from that from that perspective, and people are still thinking about it. <clears throat> Another perspective is to locate the holographic dual near the static patch observer. So static patch observer uh, denotes some observer who like lives here, and this is their patch, this little triangle here. Um, and, you know, people think about locating a dual, you know, you ma imagine drilling a little tube around the static patch observer, and you locate the holographic dual near there. Uh, the idea there is that that region is actually, it's not a conformal boundary, but it's a little bit similar to an ADS conformal boundary. So it's a somewhat natural place to locate a holographic dual. And there are various um, sets of authors from different perspectives trying to construct or think about holography in that way. And the other natural place is, of course, the cosmic horizon, the things that I've drawn here. You might want to locate the holographic dual there in the same way that we used to talk about holography for a black, um, holography sort of pre ADS CFT, the way uh, Tuft or Susskind kind of thought about it as uh, being located on the event horizon of a black hole. Here you kind of locate the degrees of freedom on the cosmic horizon in some way. These last two things are observer dependent. This one explicitly, you locate the dual near static patch observer. So I picked a particular observer. Um, this one somewhat implicitly, as I said already, the cosmic horizon is observer dependent. The observer here has a different horizon than the observer at the antipodal point or one who just kind of goes somewhere in the middle. They all have different horizons. So there's some observer dependence that needs to be understood there. This one is not observer dependent, but it refers almost to meta uh, a meta observer. It talks about a slice way up here, which cuts across many observers' horizons. So they're conceptually pretty different. 
in this talk, I'm really going to be talking about the second and third options. In the first part of the talk, I'll kind of explore the second option. And in the second part of the talk, I'll explore the third option. Edgar? Yeah. Remind me, if you have an exit from inflation, where do you uh, put this uh, hat? Or is it in I, I plus or I'm kind of blanking? Yeah, if you want to, it depends a little bit exactly on the details, but yeah, you can imagine putting a flat space region here, like a little hat region um, where where you exit and then you kind of go on to flat, well, you can put whatever you want in the future, but often people put like some flat space hat up here. Is that what you're asking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can do other things too, like if you tunnel or you can pick like a little Milne patch, which is a hyperbolic patch, you can put a smaller hat up there. So different ways to add hats to the space time for exits from inflation. Yeah, crucially, I'm um, I'm not really going to be talking about uh, about exiting there. Yeah, there you have additional handles um, to to play with. But here, I'm going to imagine that you're just kind of eternally the sitter, and how you can think about that problem. Okay. That that's really where I think the puzzle really is. I mean, if the sitter is some metastable thing, and you exit, and you're eventually flat space or something, then really you shouldn't be asking the questions I'm asking. You should ask. How do you understand the sitter space as some yeah, metastable thing within some flat space S matrix or something like that? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, here the question is really if it's eternal. Yeah, but that, that might be the set of questions that makes sense and also related to observation. Uh, the one about exiting. Yeah. Well, for the past, yes. For the current phase we're yeah. entering, we don't know. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll go through this quickly for this audience. The main tool I'm going to be using is computing uh, entanglement entropy of some of some dual theory. And the way that's done, so here's the entanglement entropy, OK? Um, it's given by extremizing a quantity called the generalized entropy. So here I have a cartoon of ADS CFT. Here's the ADS boundary. And what I'm trying to compute is the entropy uh, of the CFT um, of the density matrix within this dash circle. So it's entanglement between the stuff in this dash circle and stuff outside of it. And the way that's done is by extremizing this quantity where the area refers to the area of this pink surface. S matter refers to the matter entropy contained within the pink surface. And I extremize that quantity with respect to uh, this surface itself. Okay. And once I do that, then on that extremum, this combination computes for me that entropy in the CFT, All right? This, um, this is the thing I'm going to be using. The reason I bring this up is just to uh, remind ourselves of a, a key kind of a physical um, uh, thing that comes from, from, from this picture, which is uh, what's called entanglement wedge reconstruction. And it's a statement that the you know when we talk about ADS CFT we talk about an entire uh, you know string theory in ADS being dual to an entire CFT on the boundary, but nowadays we understand better the notion of subregion duality. So the uh, sharpest notion we have, or maybe the most um, uh, most general notion we have, is entanglement wedge reconstruction, which basically says that the data within this pink surface in the bulk uh, is encoded. Um, in the CFT data just within this dashed region. So you don't need the whole CFT if you're only asking about a subregion of the bulk. You can get away with just knowing like a piece or uh, some of the CFT. Okay. Now, if that's true, then there's a, a basic sort of logical consistency principle which has to be true, which is that if I grow this dashed circle on the boundary, then the interior of the pink region had better grow. The pink surface itself had better get uh, bigger or at least not smaller. Because if you access more of the boundary theory, you'd better encode more of the bulk. That's just a logical consistency principle that's going to come from the idea of entanglement wedge reconstruction. Okay, and it's just true in ADS CFT. But when you start exploring more exotic things like the sitter space, you had better check that such things uh, remain true. All right. Well, let me pause for a second. Any questions before we go on to sort of exploring the first? style of holography, which is that for a static patch observer. OK. So let me go ahead. So it hasn't. So here I'm going to kind of uh, operate a little bit uh, in analogy to the black hole case. I don't think it's escaped uh, anyone who's thought about to sitter space time that the Penrose diagram to sitter space time, which I've redrawn here, 
uh, looks like the Penrose diagram of an eternal black hole. All that means is that the causal structure is the same. Okay, the geometries are, are, are very different. They're almost inverses of one another. They're very different, uh, but the causal structure is the same. And what was useful in recent computations of uh, the page curve and things like that in black holes is to append to this Penrose diagram of the eternal black hole in ADS, some flat space region that we call these flat space wings. Okay, you append it to the left and the right and upgrade it out because here you ignore the effects of gravity. Red means gravity is important. You're considering its effects. Gray means you ignore the effects of gravity, okay? Okay, in De Sitter space, as I said, these regions are not like conformal boundaries. Space is ending here, so I can't really add a flat space wing, but I can kind of drill out some world tube or something like that. And by fiat, say that I'm going to ignore the effects of gravity in this region. Okay, th when I emphasize this is a, is a weird thing to do, it's partly why I brought up in my cautionary tale, the fact that you don't have an asymptotic region with weak gravity. Uh, it doesn't, it's not clear that it makes sense to do this. This is just meant as a mock-up for something that is more sensible. For example, if you put a uh, De Sitter space-time within asymptotically ADS space-time, um, there are constructions of that. In those cases, the De Sitter space is behind a black hole horizon. The details aren't important, but in that type of situation, then you could append, for example, flat space regions to the ADS boundary that the De Sitter space is in. So it's just meant as a mock-up for that. The details are actually not gonna be important for the sort of universal lesson I want to convey. So if you're worried about this, um, maybe kind of hold on to your worry for a few minutes and then uh, bring it up and complain later if you, if you think something has gone awry. Okay. Finally, I find it very helpful in these um, computations of entropies to know exactly what entropy you're computing, okay? At least in the early days of these computations, there's a lot of confusion of what entropy is being computed. Is it in the bulk? Is it the boundary? Is it fine-grained? Is it semi-classical? So for that, it's helpful to have a picture of what the, to have a microscopic picture. Okay, here we know what that is. You have some uh, red quantum system and it's thermal field double partner, which are sort of describing uh, the physics of this gravitating region here. It's like the CFT dual, for example. But now because of these flat space regions, they're interacting with some semi-infinite baths. There's some CFT, let's say in one higher dimension, it's interacting with this quantum system and they're all together in the thermal field double state with their partner over here, okay? Usually this is done in a two-dimensional bulk space time. So this is often called the quantum dot or the SYK dot, and this is the CFT two, but this could be in any dimensions. Okay, here we have the perspective of some kind of uh, static patch observer holography where there's some quantum system and it's you know entangled partner or maybe it's also interacting with the partner, but some quantum systems which are describing the gravitational physics here. And now they're interacting not with a semi-infinite bath because this is a finite interval, but some finite bath. So there's some CFT and let's say a finite interval there and there. Okay, in this left-hand picture, you know, you could compute, for example, the um, entropy, let's say, of this entire system. And what you find is that the, you, you know, you look for some extremal surface, you pick up this extremal surface, the black hole bifurcate horizon, and it's then interpreted as basically the entanglement between the two sides of this space time or between, you know, this system and that system. So the black hole entropy in these constructions has a nice interpretation as an entanglement entropy between the two sides. It's natural to ask over here, is there a similar interpretation of the cosmic horizon? Is that the entanglement between you know, the two static patches? And that's the first question we're gonna explore. Okay, how are we gonna explore that question? Well, I drew the microscopic picture because I wanted to declare what it is I'm computing uh, there. And what I'm computing there is basically the entropy of the quantum system plus a little bit of the of the bath region. Okay, it doesn't re really matter how big a region you pick, just some of it. What that amounts to in the bulk picture, using the really kind of um, standard, like a QES type formula, is that you want to extremize the same combination we saw before, the generalized entropy, with respect to this left endpoint. Okay, so this right endpoint is fixed because it's in the non-gravitating region. You want to extremize this combination with respect to this left endpoint. 
Okay, well, we know the first piece of the formula, area divided by 4G Newton. Remember, this is a Penrose diagram. So each point of it is a sphere. We can be doing this in D dimensions. Let's say we're in four dimensions. So this point is a two sphere. And we know what the geometry is. So we know how to compute this part of the formula. S matter is, of course, much more difficult. The reason why a lot of these black hole computations were done, at least analytically, in one plus one dimensions is because we have nice control over CFT entanglement entropy formulas in one plus one dimensions. Okay, we have less control in higher dimensions. Here, though, I'm not going to need an exact formula. It turns out that um, it's enough to have some constraints on the matter entropy, and that's going to be the entropy in this interval or this region. Um, it's going to have it's going to be enough to have some constraints on that quantity to to make the point that I want to make. But anyway, that's the technical problem: is to extremize this combination and in the end, you can do better here because the sitter space is conformal to, to flat space. That's like a technical trick um, that helps you, but that's what we need. We need matter for some region at t equals zero in the hartle hawking state on d-dimensional to sitter space time. I'm not really gonna go into the details of the computation. You can ask me about it if you want, but the basic point is that you can actually use strong subadditivity of entanglement entropy. It turns out this region um, maps to the entropy using conformal transformations. You can map it to the entropy of an uh, annulus region in flat space, by which I mean the region between two spheres in general dimensions. And that thing we can constrain, strong subadditivity constrains that entropy. And if you use the constraints that it gives you and some knowledge about the various limits of the thin annulus and thick annulus limit, you can actually locate an extremum in the left wedge. Okay, so this point, which I call R1, which is where the extremum is, actually lives in the left region. So somehow the right microscopic system is kind of reaching out all the way into the left region if we believe this answer. And if you're worried about these inequality constraints and locating it somewhere here, you can actually compute an exact formula in some one plus one dimensional model. There you can explicitly solve for R1 for the extremum, and you'll find that it has some formula for it and it lives in the left-hand region. In general dimension, you can't pinpoint it exactly, but you can argue that it's somewhere here. Okay, that's nice. That seems kind of interesting and exciting. We found this um, extremal surface. Uh, but the point of the first half of my talk is that this is wrong. Okay, this is wrong because if you use this as an extremum, it's going to violate that kind of logical consistency principle we were talking about before which is uh, if you believe in entanglement wedge reconstruction, then you have to believe in entanglement wedge nesting and that's violated. The way that's violated is if I move this point R2 to the right, which if you remember in the microscopic picture kind of means I'm probing more of the microscopic description, um, then it turns out R1 does not move to the left as it should. It doesn't encode more of the bulk, it moves to the right. Okay, so it moves in the wrong direction. The entanglement wedges are not nested in the way they're supposed to be. Okay, you made the region in the boundary description bigger and your bulk region got smaller. That clearly means something went wrong. Okay, uh, what went wrong? Well, uh, what went wrong is a point that I think has not um, uh, really been emphasized too much in these sorts of computations, which is that the extremal surface that uh, I found, I labeled it here, I called it a mini max surface. Okay, and that's because this extremal surface is. Um, you know, as language is mirroring the language of maxi min surfaces, the surface is in some sense a minimum in time and a maximum in space. And if you're familiar, for example, with uh, Aaron Wall's reformulation of the Ryu Takanagi proposal, um, there's some maxi min uh, construction which gives you some extremal surface, which is a maximum in time and a minimum in space. And okay, there's actually a good reason why we look for those kinds of surfaces. Um, and it's because as you can see from this example, if you pick surfaces that weren't of that nature, then you'll run into problems with entanglement wedge nesting. Okay, that's one reason why we often look for maxi min surfaces. I mean, it's opaque from the Ryu Takanagi perspective. Of course, if you use the maxi min proposal, then it's just in the rules of it. But you can ask, what about these other extremal surfaces? And they have exactly this problem. The way to see, by the way, that this is a mini max surface is because this is just a quantum cousin of the classical extremal surface, the one that lives right here. And if you remember, the sitter space is something that's infinitely big in the past. It shrinks to some minimum time at t equals zero and becomes infinitely big again. So it's a minimum in time at t equals zero. And it's a maximum in space because this is like the great circle. It's like out there surrounding us. So it's a maximum in space and a minimum in time. 
even though it's an extremum, it's not an appropriate uh, Ryu Takenagi or QES uh, surface. I guess that's redundant. It's not a good QES. <laughs> um, okay, that 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 is a little disappointing because um, it's I talked a lot about this analogy between black hole horizons and cosmic horizons. You know, black hole horizons were interpreted as an entanglement entry between two sides. It's natural to want to interpret the cosmic horizon the same way, but at least in this way of doing things, you can't avoid the fact that the the geometric nature of the surface is different. Okay, and that's that's the first sort of point I want to make in the first half of my talk. And I'll pause there in case there are any questions about it. Yeah, I have a quick question. How do you know that uh, your geometrical interpretation of R2 in the sort of supposed boundary uh, description is correct? I mean, so so you have an intuition that the R2 is the, the length of the boundary description, but there, there could be other prescriptions that maybe resolves that issue. Um, you're talking about how I mapped this region to this yeah. region? No, I mean, I mean, how do you decide that, you know, uh, the, the nesting prescription, right? I mean, you want to say that uh, bigger, the bigger regions in the boundary descriptions yeah. are, are nested, but why, do you, why, why is it forced on you that the length of this interval between R and R2 is the description of how large its region is? I mean, it's not like literally a quantum description on that interval or, or is it, I don't know. Well, uh, I'm not totally sure I understand the question, but I am assuming entanglement wedge reconstruction, meaning, okay, so there are two assumptions here. One is that once I pick some region here, there's some prescription into what region that maps to here. There, I think we're pretty safe that okay. it doesn't really matter exactly. Maybe it shifts a little bit here, but okay, it's, it's at some point. And then the other assumption is the entanglement wedge reconstruction, which says that whatever I land on, the statement is that this region is encoded um, by this much of the boundary system. So those are just the two assumptions I'm using, if you want. Okay. And then you run into this problem. And, and the first assumption you can make sharper by doing something that's a little more UV complete, like I was saying, like embed the sitter space in something that's asymptotically ADS, then put some flat space uh, regions, and then ask about entropies of the quantum system plus some of the flat space region. In those constructions, uh, you'd have other reasons not to worry about this cosmic horizon. But if you tried to use it as a QES, then you would run into this problem. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions about it? Okay. So that is the lesson in the first part of the talk. Minimax surfaces are bad. Uh, you don't use them as Ryu Takanagi surfaces or QESs. Um, you know, they seem, uh, they might be more related to something like complexity because they're maximal surfaces, but actually the nature of this maximal surface is even different than uh, the maximal surfaces that are discussed in the context of a Python's launch or complexity. So it really seems to be a, a different kind of surface that needs interpreting. Okay, well, that's, um, not great uh, because, uh, you know, okay, I don't want to give up hope on using the cosmic horizon in some ways, interpreting entanglement entropy between two sides because I don't know, that seems to be clearly what it is. So uh, let's try again. Let's try again. And now let's talk about the other perspective on holography where you place the dual theory on the horizon itself. Okay. And now you have to face this question that I brought up also in the cautionary tale, which is if you say the dual theory is on the horizon, uh, which side of the horizon is encoded? Okay, like with black holes, I said it was natural to talk about one side being encoded, or even in ADS CFT, when you place the boundary dual on the boundary of ADS, there's only space time to one side, and that's the side that it encodes. Okay, there's no mystery there. Here, there are two sides of space and time to uh, two sides of space to the horizon. So you have to ask which side is encoded. And I'm going to argue uh, an analogy again to ADS. Um, so here I've drawn the same picture we had before, a thermal field double black hole, let's say in D-dimensional ADS with some flat space regions. Here's the microscopic picture of what's going on that we also discussed. In the right column, I have the doubly holographic picture. You could ignore it. It's actually, it's just there for people who, who, who like these pictures. It's not um, uh, going to be important for, for what I want to say. Um, but you can modify this example, and people have modified this and studied it. Instead of 
let's look at the microscopic picture. It's easiest to discuss from there. Instead of having a semi-infinite CFT that interacts with this quantum system in red, you can cut it off to be a finite system and then tack on on the other end, let's say another copy of the same quantum system, of the red quantum system, and you do the same thing to the thermal field double partner, okay? So this is now the microscopic picture of what you had. The dual description now, because these are finite regions, you're gonna have finite regions in gray. And now there's gonna be an additional gravitating space time, the blue one, which in a sense is dual to the blue quantum systems here. Okay, there's something you can do, you can study this, you can compute entanglement entropies, do whatever you want. Um, it's a reasonable system. And now of course, it's clear what to do to connect to um, what we're discussing with the De Sitter horizon. You can shrink this region to zero size. Okay, this blue quantum system is interacting with the CFT on this interval, which is interacting with this red quantum system. So when you shrink it to zero size, it all just becomes some self-interacting quantum system. Okay, red and blue make purple, or I guess it looks more like pink, but whatever, they make this color. Um, so it just becomes some self-interacting quantum system in a thermal field double state with its partner. And in the bulk description, you know, that region is shrunk to zero size. So now you just have like an ADS boundary and it has space time to both sides. I should have said this Penrose diagram is periodically identified. So this vertical line is identified with that vertical line there. Um, but yeah, you can take this limit. Uh, in this W holographic picture, it's sometimes called wedge holography, but okay, it's a, it's a limit you can take. And here's the, the space time dual picture. Sorry, Edgar. <clears throat> yeah. Um, Let's see. Do, do we have to worry about a phase transition if if I if I shrink this? That I guess somehow the the red would stop being entangled, or I guess be entangled more with the blue, more and more with the blue, and not enough with the other red to preserve some geometrical ADSD there. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, you could think about this how to prepare this state in the boundary description. So, you know, here we have, you know, we have a semi-infinite cylinder and that's the path integral we're cutting to prepare this state. And the one boundary is where the quantum systems are. You know, in this lower system, it's a finite uh, cylinder with quantum systems at like both ends. And I don't really see a problem that would occur if I shrunk that path integral preparation of the state to zero size. Of course, I haven't told you what the microscopic um, interactions are between these and those. So yeah, there's some subtlety there and like how you take that limit and that system quote disappears. <laughs> um, but uh, it's, yeah, it, it's meant slightly heuristically because we don't have precise microscopic constructions of these things that I drew here. I'm not sure if that was your concern but the precise microscopic prescription. No, I think just a little bit more general but I, I think I'm okay with this. I guess the last picture, yeah. So you wanna, I think I'm okay with that last picture. Okay. Um, you can always regulate it a little bit if you want. Uh, yeah. Somehow it can still make my point. I mean, I like this one where it's not regulated. Yeah, yeah you can regulate a little bit. Um, but all, all I wanna make, the point I wanna make with this analogy is that there's no mystery as to what's going on here. Uh, these systems, which in a sense live on these ADS boundaries encode both sides. Now, you know, now there's space time to both sides of the boundary. And both sides are encoded by these quantum systems, okay? We usually don't study ADS-CFT like this, except recently people have, um, and, and that's the prescription. And in particular, when you're computing extremal surfaces, meaning when you're computing entanglement entropies uh, of divisions of this quantum system, you really find extremal surfaces that live on both sides of the boundary, on the blue side and the red side. Of course, if you have access to the regulated picture, there are more refined questions you can ask, like you can, pick up the blue system in the reduced density matrix, but not the red system. But if you only have access to this picture, then you sort of have to divide uniformly. You know, If you pick half the sphere, then you sort of have to pick half the blue sphere, half the sphere of this region and half the red sphere. You know, sort of have to, um, when you refine it, it has to be done symmetrically because you can't ask, it's not clear to ask more refined questions here. All to say, the system encodes both sides of the boundary and you, compute extremal surfaces on both sides. Okay, that's really just motivational because in De Sitter space, I'm just gonna kind of make up a rule now. <laughs> um, so as we're discussing, the dual theory lives on the cosmic horizon. The way I wanna think about that globally 
is that you imagine taking a global time slice. Um, that's a sphere, as I said, that looks like this. Here's the left and right cosmic horizons. And I've labeled the various regions. And the microscopic theory, the dual theory, I'm going to say lives on this pair of horizons, OK, in some sense. Uh, this final picture is just a visual aid that I'm going to use in the rest of the talk. It's just splitting up the three kind of different regions, the exterior and the two interiors. OK. So the way I motivated things, um, if you wanted to compute entanglement entropy of this holographic dual theory, the way you do it is you'd find extremal surfaces on both sides of the horizons, OK? That's what, uh, in this paper, Lenny Susskind and I wrote together, we called the bilayer proposal. Uh, it's called that because of, if you think about things from the bit thread formulation, it, it makes sense that there are sort of two layers emitting bit threads, but it's just a name. Um, but Lenny had an independent proposal um, which was that if you want to compute entanglement entropy, you really extremize in between. You only extremize in between the horizons. You don't find extremal surfaces that live in these, what I call these interior regions. You only find extremal surfaces that live in this exterior region. And we called that the monolayer proposal. I'm going to do some examples with these proposals, which hopefully will make it clear exactly what's being computed. Um, but before I get there, and the examples I'm computing are just classical. So before we're talking about extremizing the generalized entropy, the area plus the matter contribution. In these examples, I'm just gonna be talking about extremizing the area, but I do wanna make the point uh, in support of uh, the bilayer proposal, which is that if you find extremal surfaces to both sides of the horizons, then you'll have a natural notion of an entanglement wedge because you'll find some kind of closed surface with an interior. And when you have a natural notion of an entanglement wedge, there's an obvious quantum extremal surface extension of this rule where you add in the matter entropy contained within the entanglement wedge. You know, if you only have an extremal surface living to one side of the horizon, then you can't really define a kind of closed region. So it's not clear. I mean, yeah, it's not exactly clear what the quantum extension would be. But let's compute in some examples. And let's start off computing just in pure de Sitter space, OK? So I've redrawn pure de Sitter space, and I want to compute the entropy of the left horizon, All right? So how do we do that? Well, let's compute things using the bilayer prescription first. I said you need to extremize to the interior and to the exterior. Okay, when you extremize to the interior, well, since I've picked the entire horizon, the surface is allowed to shrink and slip off the end and give you zero, okay? In other words, the trivial or null surface is an allowed extremal surface, which satisfies the homology constraint. So you don't pick up a contribution from the interior extremization. When you extremize to the exterior, it's not gonna wanna go out here because the area is larger out here. It's just gonna sit right on the horizon, okay? If you add those two things together, you'll get the area of the cosmic horizon divided by 4G noon. And as I discussed, there's a well-defined notion of an entanglement wedge. It's this blue shaded region. It's the interior of the cosmic horizon, okay? That, that's good, I mean, we would, guess that if you compute the entropy of one of the two horizons, you should get the gibbons hawking entropy. And the new thing that is actually giving you this is to extremize um, uh, outside of the horizon. Because people in the past had tried to compute extremal surfaces anchoring to the cosmic horizon, but they only computed them here. So when they computed the entropy of a single full horizon, they got zero. <laughs> uh, and the, the sort of novelty here is to is really that there's some exterior extremization, which is important. And that's giving you the answer that I think most of us like, which is that you pick up the gibbons hawking entropy. The other thing that's nice is that the horizon is now actually a maximum surface. There's a way to reformulate this prescription, which okay, I won't really do, which is to formulate it as a sort of maximum statement. Uh, this may sound a little bit weird because, you know, we're used to thinking of extremal surfaces as just having some geometric nature unrelated to sort of how you formulate things, but that's not really quite true. Uh, the way the problem is formulated here, this is really a good maximum surface. More practically, what that means is you won't see violations of entanglement wedge nesting in any of these computations that I'm going to discuss. There isn't a general proof that it never happens, but there are pretty strong arguments that it, it shouldn't happen. And as I said, in the examples, it won't happen. OK, that's the entropy of one horizon. We can also ask about the global entropy, the entropy of the full microscopic theory. 
you know, whenever we compute this in ADS CFT, we should get zero as the full entropy. Um, like in this picture that I had, if I computed the entropy of uh, this purple quantum system union its thermophile double quantum system, I would get zero. Okay, there's only entropy if I compute one of the two. Here, the same thing happens. I get zero. The way to see it is the interior extremization is still zero, and the right interior is the same. It's symmetric. And in the exterior extremization, since I picked both horizons, effectively the surfaces can come together and annihilate. Okay, and in other words, the trivial surface is again an acceptable uh, classically extremal surface. That means that the entropy is zero because I didn't get any contribution from any of them. And the entanglement wedge is the entire space time. That's also the answer we want. We expect that the entropy of de Sitter space has something to do with tracing out stuff beyond the horizon. Uh, we don't think that the global system really has an entropy associated to it. So it's nice to recover uh, that expectation from this proposal. And of course, if the full microscopic system is on the union of the horizons, I had better get that the entanglement wedge is the full space time. And Edgar, I entropy. Can I, yeah. Can I ask a question, please? In the case where you're looking at just like the single horizon, say HL, what picks out that the extremal, the extremal surface and the exterior extremization should, should be sitting on HL and not on, for instance, HR? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's basically because, okay, in these situations where you have a, okay, so numerically, of course, it doesn't matter. You would get the same numerical answer. Um, so the question is really about what the entanglement wedge is. Mm -hmm. And in entanglement wedge reconstruction, there are sort of errors in the prescription. So that such, you know, they scale with G Newton in some way, such that whenever you have an exact degeneracy, the rule is you're only really able to reconstruct faithfully the smaller entanglement wedge. So in this case where they're exactly degenerate, you have to pick the one with the smaller entanglement wedge. It's an interesting question to ask if I now put in some perturbations and try and like make right. them a different size, what happens? Um, and we explored that a little bit. Um, yeah, we explored a little bit. It's interesting because then it seems that one of the horizons can start encoding some of the exterior on its own. Mm -hmm. um, okay, that's unclear exactly what that means. My interpretation of that, which I think there's other evidence for is that these two quantum systems are not only entangled, but they're interacting is how I view it. But in this, in this simple example, you don't really need to, to worry about this thing of the left horizon encoding the exterior on its own because it won't. Okay. Yeah, Thanks. good question though. Okay. Can, can, uh, can I ask a somewhat orthogonal question? Can, can you uh, invent a similar prescription for the eternal black hole in, you know, the Sitter and, and try to do things like that, the anchor surfaces at the horizon? That's a fantastic question. Uh, I'll comment on it on my final slide. OK. All yeah. right. It looks like you're proving that this is not a sensible thing to do in that case. But OK, yeah. Oh, no, that's not what I think. But maybe okay. you'll, you'll explain then. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, OK, the way I computed things right now is using this bilayer proposal, extremizing on both sides of the horizon. You can ask, what about the monolayer proposal? Uh, it gives the same answer for the entropies, because all these interior extremizations I was doing didn't contribute to the answer at all. So numerically, you get the same answer for the entropies. So that's good. They, they agree. OK. There's another example, which in the interest of time, I'll skip. It's the example of Schwarzschild de Sitter. So the Penrose diagram of this is a little different. Here's the metric. You can compute again the entropy of the left horizon or the union of the horizons, and you get similar answers. For the left horizon, you get the sum of the black hole and cosmic horizon entropies. Uh, for the union of the horizons, you get zero. Um, but I don't want to get into the details of this because I want to get to an interesting example to close out the talk. And the monolayer theory gives the same answers as well. So nothing particularly new happens for Schwarzschild de Sitter. This might look insane, but remember the topology of Schwarzschild de Sitter is different. <laughs> it's a periodic identification. OK, so so far, the bilayer and monolayer theory give you the same answers. So you can ask, why did I make a big stink about phrasing the two different things? Um, and it's because uh, there is a case where they give different answers. And it's not clear that that case is, is reasonable. It's sort of even more speculative than the stuff I've been talking about so far. And it corresponds to taking a subregion of a horizon, okay, which I haven't done yet. I've either considered the full left horizon or both horizons. And of course, in ADS CFT, we can take subregions of the CFT. There's no nothing weird about doing that. But uh, for various reasons, doing this is a little bit more like take like trying to slice up the compact manifold, like taking a subregion of the S5, and that 
people have thought about and studied and made proposals about, but it's still not clear exactly uh, what that means. So, okay, take this with a grain of salt, but it's interesting, so let's do it. Um, and what happens is the following. Let's say I take a subregion on just the left horizon. So here I've drawn the subregion, okay? And I look for the extremal surface. If I extremize to the interior, it's actually just the region itself. This picture is a little confusing because I picked a weird time slice, but it's true that if I extremize to the interior, I'll just pick up the piece of the horizon itself, you know, whose entropy I'm trying to compute. Similarly for the exterior. So as I make this region bigger, it's growing at twice the fraction, uh, you know, twice the system size, right? Because there's a factor from the interior extremization and the factor from the exterior extremization. So it's growing at twice the system size, meaning at the halfway point, it's going to equal the area of the cosmic horizon. And then soon after that, it's going to exceed it. Okay, this, I'm phrasing this in a way which hopefully makes the analogy to the entropy crisis in black holes similar. There also, when we compute the entropy of the Hawking radiation of the black hole, it's getting bigger and bigger. And at some point, the entropy is becoming so large that it's exceeding the entropy of the black hole horizon. And there we have great reason to believe that that shouldn't happen. Here it's less clear. Remember, we're trying to probe the idea of whether you could think of de Sitter space or de Sitter horizon as being a finite quantum system. Well, if that quantum system's Hilbert space is, has e to the area of a 4G Newton states, we're about to violate that at the half, you know, around here. So the central dogma is threatened. But there's a transition. There's a phase transition, again, similar to what happens in uh, the black hole case, um, where after the halfway point, you know, it's no longer favorable for the interior extremization to sit right on the surface you're considering, which would have been this one. It's actually favorable for it to flip around and come down to this surface down here. Okay, that has smaller area. And the sum of this region and this region is just the full horizon entropy because it's just splitting the horizon into two complementary pieces. So right when you're about to violate the central dogma, right when you're about to exceed the number of states you think you can have, a new extremal surface kicks in. The entropy saturates at basically the maximum value allowed. And the entanglement wedge goes from being none of the interior to being all of the interior. Okay, I phrase this to highlight the analogy with black holes as much as possible. There you would say the same words. You're about to violate um, the bound on entropy. A phase transition happens because of a new extremal surface. And the entanglement wedge is now suddenly all of the interior. Okay, It's not clear that the actual physics is at all similar. Of course, the phase transition happens in all sorts of places. But I find the analogy a little striking. Now, here, we're not computing the entropy of Hawking radiation or anything like that. But I still find the analogy somewhat striking. You might worry a little bit, though. Because uh, de Sitter space we think of as a thermal system usually, right? Um, has a temperature and everything. And this entropy curve, this is an entropy curve as a function of subsystem size. And it does not look like the entropy curve of a thermodynamic system, okay? Uh, so you might worry that this is a bit of a strange behavior. It has a sharp feature. And if you worried about this, uh, you would be comforted a little bit by the fact that if you compute it in the monolayer theory, you would actually find a much more comfortable curve, which looks like the entropy curve of a thermodynamic system. In particular, it's extensive. The reason that happens is because the stuff here doesn't even play a role in the monolayer theory. You only pick up this surface that I've drawn here, and that just grows as a fraction of the system size. That's it. So it just grows linearly until the end. OK. Uh, I'm purposely trying to set up a false idol here, okay? Uh, though we sometimes talk about the Sitter space as being a thermal system and use that language, um, it's, not, it's not really a traditional thermodynamic system. And here I just want to make what is an old point, uh, which is that the large end limit is not the same as the classic thermodynamic or large volume limit, the thing you learn in undergrad or grad statistical mechanics as a thermodynamic limit, okay? It's very good at mimicking certain features of the thermodynamic limit. And um, I, I wrote a paper uh, many years ago now talking about this and then a, a shorter kind of essay reviewing it. And the basic idea is that holographic systems are really good at pretending they're in the thermodynamic limit um, because many of them have certain higher form symmetries in particular, like N equals four has a, has a center symmetry, it has a one form symmetry. 
And the pattern of the breaking of this symmetry at strong coupling um, means that many observables behave like they're in the thermodynamic limit. Okay, what's a simple example? Let's take n equals four um, and put it on a spatial three torus. And let's compute the entropy, not at infinite temperature, at some finite temperature, but above the Hawking page phase transition temperature. Okay, so in the black hole phase. Now, for a random thermal system, that entropy need not be extensive because you have all these finite length scales and a finite temperature. So there's dimensionless combinations you can make. And the entropy can have a bunch of subextensive corrections. But n equals four strong coupling does not. Okay, its entropy looks extensive even when you're not at infinite temperature. So, and you could explain this from the point of view of this uh, higher form symmetry. And in this particular case, there's simpler ways to explain it. Uh, but nevertheless, um, for this observable, you can explain it this way. And there are other quantities as well, like correlation functions and things like that, sort of behave like they're, um, they don't have any non-trivial sub-extensive corrections. So they're good at mimicking the thermodynamic limit, but they're not amazing. Um, there's a simple quantity you could compute and let's compute, for example, um, let's be in the thermal field double state and compute the entropy of a subregion of one of the two CFTs, region R. Okay, here are the Ryu Takanagi surfaces. For a small enough region, you just probe the UV. They don't know about the black hole. The black hole is the thing in gray here. As you make the region bigger, it starts feeling it. And as you make it bigger, it starts feeling it more and more. And then there's a phase transition at an order one fraction of the system size where the surface snaps into this one union, one that sits right on the horizon itself. And as you make the region even bigger, this surface just stays there and then the surface gets smaller and smaller. This is meant to sound a lot like what happened in the De Sitter case. At an order one fraction of the system size, you tap out the kind of thermal entropy of the system. That happens here as soon as you start hugging this horizon. Okay, that is, this is not extensive behavior in any sense, even though we talk about the black hole phase or black holes as thermal systems. It's clear what's going on. Uh, we're not at infinite temperature for large volume. They're the same for a CFT. If we were to go to the classic thermodynamic or large volume limit, we would take infinite temperature, which means this black hole would get very large and sit very close to the boundary. And this transition I'm talking about would get pushed to arbitrarily uh, late times or arbitrarily large region sizes. Then you would recover the extensive curve, which we like and are comfortable with for ordinary thermodynamic systems. But if you're not in that limit, it's just not a thermodynamic system. All this to say, this curve should not bother you so much. Here, it happens at exactly half the system size, okay, uh, the transition. And here, it's definitely greater than half the system size. But nevertheless, um, qualitatively, it's a similar effect. We, it has a temperature, but it's not a traditional thermodynamic system. Any questions about that? And then I'll, I'll kind of close with a concrete example. Um, but here I just want to display some of the qualitative physics. Okay, so I tried to argue that that curve is not crazy, uh, but how can you reproduce it? Okay, so okay, here's a here's a toy model that uh, Lenny and I came up with. It's you know not a holographic dual for De Sitter space or anything like that, but it's just to show that you can reproduce something like this entropy curve. And it's the simplest toy model you can imagine. It's a Heisenberg antiferromagnet. So you have two qubits, sigma and tau. They're, this is the Hamiltonian that governs them. It's some antiferromagnetic interaction, J is positive. Um, you can solve the system exactly. Okay, you can compute for the thermal density matrix, E to the minus beta H. Yeah, you can compute that thermal density matrix exactly. And you can ask about the entropy at uh, various temperatures. Okay, at zero temperature, the system's in the spin singlet state. So the entropy of two qubits uh, is zero. The entropy of zero qubits is, of course, zero. And if you're in the spin singlet, you're in like basically a bell pair. So the entropy of one qubit is as big as it could be. It's log two. All right. At infinite temperature, you recover this nice extensive curve we're talking about. The entry of one qubit is log two. The entry of two qubits is two log two. You know, they're in a maximally mixed with their thermal field double partners. Okay. So you can ask, well, is there some intermediate temperature where I can make the curve look like the bilayer curve? Here, you might worry about the entropy of one qubit shifting off this log two point at intermediate temperatures. It turns out in this model, there's some SU2 symmetry, which pro pro uh, protects the density matrix of one qubit to just be maximally mixed. So at any temperature, the entropy of one qubit is at log two. 
then clearly there's some intermediate temperature where the entry of two qubits is also a log two. Okay, it turns out it's here. It's that order, some order one number times j. So this curve, of course, is meant to look like this curve. It's of course a cheap example because it's just two qubits. There's no structure between these red dots in this curve. What we would like to do is, uh, you know, maybe a model with more degrees of freedom, which actually gives you a curve which fills out the regions in between. But I think it's still instructive because the reason you get this kind of um, sub-extensive behavior has a lot to do with the sort of surface to volume ratio that's available in this system. And that surface to volume ratio here, because you just have two qubits, is always like order one. And we sort of expect the theories that are dual to the sitter space to be non-local in a way where the surface to volume ratio um, is also kind of always order one. But anyway, that's a sort of toy, toy model. Okay, I'm basically out of time. So let me just summarize and talk about some future directions. The first lesson was that the cosmic horizon is very different than the black hole horizon. It's a mini max surface instead of a maxi min surface. So it doesn't naively work as a quantum or even classical extremal surface. Okay. But, uh, okay, I, I didn't want to, we didn't want to give up on using the cosmic horizon to compute some sort of entropy. So the only way I know how to do that without running into these issues is to sort of anchor surfaces to the horizon itself. Then you can use the horizon and its associated entropy without violating entangling wedge nesting. Okay. So, okay, that's good. And there are various, you know, we can compute in some examples and got some reasonable answers, uh, which is nice. But of course, in the sitter space, it's hard to compare to things. Uh, which brings up the question which Moshe asked, which is very natural to ask. Can you just apply the same proposal to a black hole event horizon? Um, I should preface by saying it's not clear that if it works in de Sitter space, it should also work in black holes, but nevertheless, one should explore it. It'd be natural for it to work in both cases if it works at all. So you can ask, for example, take the thermal field double in, in ADS and anchor extremal surfaces to the horizon itself. If you do that, I think you get reasonable answers and we can talk about them. Um, but the monolayer and bilayer proposals actually give you very different answers in that case, even when you don't subdivide a horizon. Uh, I'm hopeful that this is a question you might actually try and start probing in ADS CFT. You know, we have some understanding for how to compute entropies, uh, even for non extremal surfaces, which, you know, a point on the apparent horizon would be like a non extremal surface. So, I'm hoping to be able to use some of that technology to compute these things and see if you can check it in some other way or provide evidence for it. But there, at least there are more constraints so we can kind of check things. And another thing is that, you know, a lot of what I said about desitter space is very important that I was talking about global desitter space. I talked about global desitter space being encoded by a pair of horizons. Now that has its own kind of bag of gold type problem because there's all this stuff that looks like it could happen near Scribe Plus and Desitter space. So how the hell can you encode all that stuff just on this pair of horizons, which only have A over 4G degrees of freedom? And there's actually a simple way to see it in this case. Because I conditioned on global Desitter space, there isn't actually all this stuff that could happen. Global Desitter space is a bouncing cosmology. Okay, uh, th That's really constrained. If you actually try to sprinkle stuff near Scribe Plus and rewind the clock, you'll have a crunch at early times. Uh, and um, Rafael Bousseau and Arvin uh, Shivazi Mogadam tried to make this precise with some singularity theorems recently, but it's an older idea that people uh, have studied. In particular, if you thought about our universe, which seems to start with a big bang and radiation domination and then asymptotes to the sitter, there doesn't seem to be an obvious statement about one horizon or two or some finite number of horizons encoding all the stuff that can happen as scribe plus. Because you could have put all sorts of crazy stuff near the singularity, as far as we know. There isn't a semi classical way to gain control over this problem. And finally, the thing that I, I'm most interested in um, and excited by is to really try and uh, find a microscopic model which matches these features. And by these features, I really mean uh, this curve. You know, this curve, this monolayer curve may still be the correct curve, I and mean, we don't really know, but it's, of course, not a constraining curve. Any quantum system you take and put at infinite temperature will give you this curve. Okay, this one is a lot more constraining. It has a kink in it. It has a very sharp feature. Um, and you might hope to reproduce it uh, by looking at some quantum system that you believe is relevant for desitter space in some other way. For example, there are these suggestions that double scaled SYK might be relevant for describing desitter space. You can ask about the entropy curve of that system and see if it has something like this kink like structure, or you know, construct your own system. Uh, 
you know, it's sort of the business of interpreting data at the end of the day. Anyway, I'll stop there. Thanks for your time. Okay, thank you, Edgar, for a very nice and clear talk. Um, do we have any other questions for him? I do. Yeah, go ahead. So, so, so quickly, uh, you know, the reason I thought that your results saying that the, the horizon prescription will not be sensible is that it kind of uh, flips. So you said that, you know, anchoring things on the horizon in the sitter flips the minimax and maximate. So the good one is, uh, the, the bad one is flipped with the good one. That doesn't happen with oh. black holes. Because there are the good no. one is infinity. It doesn't happen. Okay. No. I see what you meant. Um, you, you're worried that, sorry, the black hole extremal surface would not become a mini max surface and exactly. cause problem. Yeah. Um, no. Yeah, I don't have a particularly cogent way of explaining now why it doesn't flip that case. I mean, we can just go through the exit. Yeah. I mean, the way you do it, so imagine the thermal field double black hole and you pick points on the apparent horizon. Yeah. And then you look for the extremal surface. In this case, the extremal surface is actually going to be the bifurcate horizon. So, okay, first of all, pick, you pick the causal diamond, and then you look at all the Cauchy slices between it, and you find a, a, the minimal surface on each Cauchy slice, and then you maximize over Cauchy slices. When you do that maximization step, it's going to go as far as it can away from the singularity. So it's going to push it down to the bifurcate horizon. Mm. Cool. And that's the maximin prescription, which gives you the bifurcate horizon, which is actually the thing that you want. Um, so yeah, it doesn't run into a problem there, although it's true. I don't have a nicer answer for why it kind of flipped in one case and not the other. I would have to, it's a little bit more empirical. I'd have to think about it. Um, okay. I have kind of a general question. So, um, with, the, I'm trying to understand what exactly the central dogma um, is is telling us about de Sitter. And I, th I think I want to sort out static patch versus the, the global picture. Um, so do you have, I mean, is there some basic assumption about the existence of a Hilbert space for the global description or um, maybe you could just re restate what, like, what do you think is is the thing we should be assuming about? I don't know the yeah, existence what, of a Hilbert what, space for yeah. for De Sitter, and and is it just yeah. for the static patch, or is it for the global? Picture? Yeah, yeah. Of course, there are various options. It's possible the notion of a Hilbert space doesn't even make sense. My preferred outcome of, of all of, yeah. of any of this is that the global Hilbert space is trivial. It's like, it's, yeah. you know, it's really like, you know, churn simons theory on a two sphere. You have a yeah. trivial global Hilbert space. And then as soon as you try and slice it up, you have a non-trivial Hilbert space. That, I mean, okay. it's, in this case, it would be of course more severe because, you know, churn simons theory, you put it on a two torus, it's no longer trivial. Here, gravity is so topological that any closed thing you put it on has a trivial Hilbert space. But then as soon as you slice it, it's non-trivial. And the central dogma is referring to that non-trivial Hilbert space that comes from slicing. That's my perspective on, on, on well, that'd be great if that happened. I think we would all be kind of happy. It's a nice picture, but uh, we don't really know, of course. It does, these statements don't seem to require too much a declaration of what the global Hilbert space is like. That kind of doesn't great. enter into these computations. Okay. I could maybe follow up on that question. I think it, I have a question that's somewhat related to what Mark was asking. So, so in this picture that you're, that you're presenting, so we have a pair of horizons and these encode a pair of static patches as well as some like intermediate region. Uh, is, is, that, is that right? Is that a fair characterization? Yeah, the intermediate region, you mean the exterior, what I call uh, the exterior yeah. region? Yeah. yeah, right, yeah, what you were calling the exterior region. Yes, yes, okay. So we have a pair of uh, static patches in the exterior region. But now, so De Sitter, I guess, though, has this like, it has this, well, the cosmological horizons have this feature that like they're, they're observer dependent. Like it depends on like picking some point at scry plus. Yeah. So presumably like, okay, maybe I could, what if instead of picking like this pair of observers at the north and south pole of uh, the sphere as it was drawn, and maybe I picked what one, of, one of the observers to be running through like the middle of this exterior region, which, so again, if the story is to be told, they, they also have a cosmological horizon, there's an antipodal observer. So there's presumably like some mapping then, like 
between this like pair of horizon theories that like if you now like exchange degrees of freedom between them like mi mix them in some certain way like you come up with some other description for like a different pair of observers um like that have different cosmological horizons yeah and my question though is um do, do we do we are there other are there examples of this anywhere else like in, like in holography like is there some way to I and mean, like given like a pair of ads boundaries like is it is it known at all are there examples of like you know exchanging degrees of freedom between um, the ADS boundaries to come up with like some other space-time description or? Um... Uh, not that I know of. I mean, everything you said until the very last thing you said, I basically agree with, and it's it's a puzzle here, how you would want to relate those descriptions. Mm -hmm. Of course, there there's also a fantasy that something like DSCFT or something that refers to a meta observer has some statement about how to connect all these different observers' descriptions. But we don't really yeah. know. I mean, it, I kind of view this as a gauge fixed sort of description. There's some symmetries that can shift around these observers and you, know, uh, you sort of fix to one of them and, and that's okay. But you really then want to understand the symmetries and how they act on the global space time to see how they might exchange different descriptions. But these are heuristic words. I don't have a good answer. You're asking a good question of, you know, okay, yeah, there, we don't have a good answer. I think you already knew that. So you're asking, is there an example in ADS where we it's similar and we do understand what to say i don't know of an obvious such example mm -hmm. um, okay yeah. those symmetries are broken non perturbatively right so which ones the, the well one all of them i guess diff, the ones that connect different uh different observers right there is this yeah box. they're they're necessarily broken non perturbatively Mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, I mean, we, yeah, we, I guess we believe that there are no symmetries at all, but uh, you, that's why I use the word kind of gauge fix that you, 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 you might hope, you might hope that there's something like a, 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 a gate, you know, the symmetry, well, they're either broken or gauged, right? Um, I'm not sure what non perturbed breaking you're talking about, but if you're talking about by instanton effects, then no, no, I'm, I'm, yeah, no, I'm 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 uh, referring to the old uh, uh, paradox of Lenny and uh, who else was there? Levin and Go here. Yeah, the the one that uh, says you know it's in it's uh, it's incompatible with uh, finite dimensional. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, so. I mean, I don't know. So right. it's good enough for me to have some symmetries that are good enough at the semi-classical level, level. So yeah, Lenny, for example, had a recent paper where he was proposing that using what we recently learned about ADS2 and JT gravity, that you could think about these symmetries as like ensemble average symmetries. They're good enough at the semi-classical level, right, but right. not at the fine grained. That would still be good enough for me to think about exchanging these various observers because I don't know, at the end, it's if it's really like finite end and everything, then everything only has so much meaning you know <laughs> um so oh, i agree but I, th I think i think once you start talking about what is the global hilbert space and how you exchange things you're you're talking about non perturbative statements um i'm not sure uh i'm not sure i needed it to be non perturbative at the level you're talking about i mean of course i'm using yeah, I'm, I'm using things that are only uh, well-defined semi-classically, but I can use them, say it, say it another way, I mean, the symmetries do what they do and shift around these observers at any order, semi-classically or non perturbatively it's just that they don't exist non perturbatively hmm. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure what the intermediate description is. I, obviously, I'm grasping at straws because it's not, it's not obvious, um, but I, I, I agree with you. One would have to understand those symmetries. Well, how they're broken or how they're gauged. I had a question. Yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, hey, Alex. Uh, so this behavior of the entanglement wedge when you were looking at subregions of one horizon was sort of interesting. So there it went from like the wedge went from nothing to everything yeah and that seemed puzzling but I, I was thinking maybe that makes sense like if you make if you uh think that the theory that lives on the horizon is like totally non-local then this is what you would expect i guess uh, okay and then well and sorry uh to me that's a little heuristic i don't know actually of like a 
actual non-local model which would have this, but yeah. I, I agree with you qualitatively, yeah. Yeah, I just say qualitatively. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then how do I think about like, I guess there's, like I guess the microscopic picture you have in mind is like two theories, one that lives on each of these horizons. And how do I think about the interactions between those or can I say something about that from the behavior of these services or? Ah, um, that's a good question. So, uh, yeah, so, okay, there are two perspectives. One is that these two systems are just in the entangled thermophile double-like state and they're non-interacting. I see. Um, but another perspective, which I think there's some evidence for, although it's hard to state precisely, is that they're actually interacting. Okay, there are two, in my mind, two pieces of evidence for this. One is um, this, uh, well, it goes back even before, but the paper I remember is called The Tall Tales in Desitter Space by Moroff, LeBlanc, and Myers. And there they just point out the thing that if you insert positive energy, um, that the Penrose diagram grows taller. So it's like the opposite of ADS, right? An ADS thermophile double black hole, you put in positive energy shocks and the wormhole becomes longer, becomes less traversable. In Desitter space, because Desitter space is ADS on its side, it actually grows taller. Um, but now that means that the two different static patches can see one another and interact. Right. So the wormhole, if you want to call it that, actually becomes traversable. That to me partially suggests that maybe these two systems are actually interacting. Another even more heuristic thing to say is that if you look at the Penrose diagram, um, you know, these horizon theories, I mean, it's a little weird to say they live on the horizon, but they kind of meet at this point. <laughs> you know, that didn't really happen when I talked about the two ADS boundaries. They never really met anywhere. So you might think that that implies that there's some interaction between the two sides. I don't know how to see from the surfaces whether there's more evidence for it. You can compute. Um, I didn't talk about it in this talk, but you could compute like hartman maldacena style surfaces, subregions on both horizons, and then try and um, uh, interpret that as like telling you something about whether they're interacting or not. Or okay, I computed those things, and I didn't really think about what it told you about whether they interact or not. But there's probably something there as well. Thanks. Edgar, can, can you make a, a toy model of this transition by thinking about these large end von Neumann algebras that Jeff and Ben and Witten were talking about? Yeah, I'd probably have to learn what those are first. Well, it's not so complicated. So in, in the in the De Sitter case, what they say is that the algebra is type two one for a static patch. Yeah. And that's that's at infinite n. Okay. I, I don't know what n is in this in this situation, but it's the same the same way that the algebra in the TFD is type three. So the thing about type two one algebras is that there's basically no. Oh, are we okay? For, okay, sorry. Uh, but there's basically no intermediate regime between type two one and and type one. Like th those are somehow type one is the most gravitational. It's it's the finite end version of the algebra. So I imagine that a, a finite n version of your construction would just be whatever finite matrix system gives you the hyperfinite 2, 1 algebra in the large n limit. But we, we know what that is. It's not so hard to write down. But I, I, sorry, I think what you're asking for in the end, at, at best, will give something like, um, sorry. I can, for example, tell you a qubit system and an entanglement pattern, which will give you exactly this curve. I think that's, well, it's qubits, yeah. so it's different type, but <laughs> I think that is gonna be like an analogous answer to your question. Um, that, that qubit system is like, if you took A over 4G qubits and interacted them with themselves, bell pair-like, and then another area over 4G qubits and put them in a thermal field double with some other ones, and computed the entropy of subregions, you would actually recover this curve in the limit that you took it to an infinite number of qubits so that you reproduce this kink. So uh, setting up an entanglement pattern, which mm -hmm. I think is what these algebra statements would maybe reduce to, but correct me if I'm wrong, is not so difficult. It's kind of getting it to come out of like a thing I can write down a Hamiltonian for. Mm. 
I see. But I'm sure there's something to be gained by thinking about it from the perspective you're asking. I, I just don't often think of it that way. So I don't have something intelligent to say about it. Is it allowed to ask question about the question? <laughs> how, how do you see that it's type two one and not type two three in that case? I think that question is uh, hard. Yeah. yeah, maybe you, I, 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 I can I can tell you offline, but it's yeah, yeah. okay. That's probably yeah. best. Yeah. I should say that that's just a claim at the moment. I mean, there's no there's no paper out about this. So. Yeah. Well, everything is just a claim at any moment, so. <laughs> Fair enough. But th this one is particularly unsubstantiated. So. Okay, uh, if we have no more questions, let's thank Edgar one more time. Thanks everybody, this was a lot of fun. Thanks Edgar. Thanks.